right. Welcome, everybody. My name is Mina Jane, and I am one of the programming librarians at the Cary Library. Very thrilled to be bringing you this program today on um, ancestral Native American cuisine and reconnecting to your um, culture. And um, I will talk about Lois in just a second, but I wanted to say that we are partnering with the Lexington Historical Society for this program, and we have Sarah McDonough here to say a couple of words. Thanks, Mina. Um, well, I just wanted to say that we are so pleased that the library has partnered uh, with us or offered to have us partner with them uh, so much this year. It's been a really great relationship, I think, for both of us. And uh, in fact, one of the last programs that we did together, in the last program that we did together that was not virtual back in March um, was with Serena Zabin, who is a Lexington native. And she's actually going to be coming back and talking to Lexington Historical Society for our next book club, uh, which is in three weeks on December 8th. So if anyone is interested in signing up for her book talk on um, her latest book, uh, which is Boston Massacre, A Family History, um, that's on our website, which is lexingtonhistory.org. Thanks, Sarah. Serena was amazing, so I hope you guys do get to it. Um, so I did want to say that I want to thank the Library Foundation, the Cary Library Foundation, for supporting all of our programs. We could not do these things without them. And, um, so, and we are recording this program. We do ask that you put um, uh, tech issues and comments in the chat. And we have the Q&A button for you to put in questions. So um, with that, I'm going to introduce Lois, who I'm so excited for you all to meet. She spent many years documenting food and life and life ways of Native American tribes from the Southwest. She, this lengthy immersion in Native American communities culminated in her book, Foods of the Southwest Indian Nations, featuring traditional and contemporary recipes. It won the James Beard Award in the Americana category and was the first Native American book to win that award. She has worked with world-renowned chefs, scientists, academ academics, I'm gonna say, and collaborated with them to publish many culinary posters and cookbooks. She has worked with national and international advertising agencies as well as many, many editorial clients as a chef and photographer. Now, um, what I love about Lois is this minute I reached out to her, she got right back to me and was so excited to do this program and to talk about her history and the Native American history, both with um, what happened with the colonists of, and um, the thanks that Native Americans give every day around food and nature and wellness. So I'm really excited about all of those topics. Welcome Lois, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so I am going to share my screen and uh, we are going to do the PowerPoint. Uh, I think you're, you're all gonna really uh, enjoy this. And um, for Native people, Thanksgiving is really every day. Uh, every day we give thanks for the bounty. And uh, in doing so, this reconnects us to our culture. And this is a big part of uh, health and wellness. So um, thank you so much uh, to our sponsors for having me here. Uh, again, my name is Lois Ellen Frank. I am actually from the Kiowa Nation on my mom's side and I am Sephardic Jewish on my dad's side. So I grew up multi-ethnic, multicultural, uh, a lot of different perspectives on uh, the same uh, way of being in life. So uh, when we feed our bodies, we also nurture the soul. And this is a very native way of looking at the world. Um, food is our medicine and our ancestors used food not only for physical health and wellness, but a connection to culture. And this wellness is spiritual uh, and that's vitally important as well. And, and especially now that we're all uh, doing things virtually and we're not uh, actually uh, physically um, encountering other people. So food is much more than something to eat. Food is our medicine, food is our sovereign right, and food is uh, definitely the key to our health and wellness. Uh, I want you to understand the history of Native American cuisine um, because in order to understand what happened uh, in a historical context, 
we must look at uh, the food and how it evolved over time. So nothing is static. Um, there are four distinct periods in Native American cuisine, the pre-contact period, the first contact period, the government issue period, and the new Native American cuisine. And the pre-contact period goes back about 10,000 years up until 1492. So first contact uh, to the south and then um, that contact spreading with different ethnic groups, uh, depending on where you are in the Americas, uh, that's going to be uh, what contact you had. I'm speaking to you in English, so we know that the English had a profound effect on the United States uh, and uh, the Spanish to the south, the French to the north. We still see French uh, language being spoken in Canada. The Dutch a little bit. New York was actually right, New Amsterdam. So that first contact will vary. Uh, the government issue is the most problematic in our history in the United States. Uh, this is when Native people were forced uh, off their ancestral homelands. We see the Trail of Tears on the East Coast. Uh, we see the Long Walk with the Navajo. Uh, my tribe relocated from its ancestral homeland. Our uh, creation stories now go back uh, to areas that are now Yellowstone, so a national park. Uh, and we were relocated to Oklahoma. So this government period beginning in the middle to late 1800s, we call it the relocation period, uh, foods were issued uh, to native people and they were expected to survive from those uh, commodity foods that were introduced very foreign to native people. The new native, this is my most favorite. Uh, this is where we are now. And this is actually foods that share components of the previous three uh, categories and these are innovatively combined or fused into what we call a new Native American cuisine. So the pre-contact period, uh, there were lots of plants and domesticated crops, all types of fruits, grains, wild animals, um, and medicinal plants. And I teach at the Institute of American Indian Art, a, a, a tribal college here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and my students compiled this list, but. Uh, they acknowledge that it is not complete. It's really just a, a beginning list of pre-contact foods. So I love this map because this map shows some of the dominant native foods that the pre-contact cuisines revolved around. So my tribe is plains. You can see those central plains there, bison, uh, dominant food. Here in New Mexico, you can see chilies coming up, the pine nut. Look at the East Coast clam bake nation, right? So this is all these uh, indigenous foods, including clams and mussels and lobster and uh, oysters. New York had so many oysters up until they were over harvested uh, that native people uh, used these foods. Uh, and that is the origin. That's where the clam uh, bake, of course, originated. Salmon. So this is a good map just to give you an idea of some foods and, and the dominant look at the wild rice uh, nation and then maple syrup, right, going in also on the East Coast and heading in towards those uh, lake regions. So there were eight ingredients, corn, bean, squash, chili, tomato, potato, vanilla, cacao, that Native people gave to the world. And up until 1492 uh, and the Columbus Exchange, uh, Columbus did bring ingredients to the old world. None of these foods existed anywhere outside of the Americas. So the Italians did not have the tomato. The Irish did not have the potato. There were no chilies in East Indian or Asian food at all. Uh, the French and the Swiss uh, did not have their delicious chocolate combining our sweet sisters, vanilla and cacao. And the Brits, their famous dish, fish and chips, they only had half of that, uh, of course, no chips. So uh, lots of foods that native people gave to the world that changed uh, the old world. Corn, uh, very important. It's the most important grain. It is the indigenous grain to the Americas. And we see corn woven uh, all throughout almost every uh, native cuisine from as far north as corn will grow to as far south as it'll grow. But corn is much more than just food, guys. Uh, corn is ceremony, song, prayer, maiden, mother, sister, healer, medicine, sustenance, food, cuisine. She's art. And she is, of course, the essence of life. So corn coming from actually a perennial 
uh, flowering plant, Z or Z maize, maize, corn, Indian corn. A lot of East Coasters will know our corn that we use uh, for lots of mushes and, and corn puddings uh, as Indian corn. It's a perennial. It is dependent on humans to cultivate. It is indigenous to the Americas and it is considered to be a gift from the creator by many, many tribes. And so giving thanks or thanksgiving, uh, a lot of it will go towards corn. Uh, corn is also used for ceremony. Here is Canal Da. This is a coming of age Navajo puberty ceremony. This is actually Chef Walter Whitewater who you're gonna meet. His daughter uh, and corn is being used for that ceremony. Corn pollen also being used. Here you see Tiffany Georgina Morgan. She's also Diné or Navajo using corn pollen to make an offering to the land to give thanks. And then in exchange, the land will grow corn and squash and sunflowers and they will be using the dry farming method. Beans on those magic eight, so healthy for you guys. We're gonna be doing uh, my version of Boston baked beans tonight. Uh, they're a slow release food, really, really, really important part of the indigenous diet. Squash is now considered a superfood. Butternut squash is the healthiest squash that we know of. Again, loaded with antioxidants, high in fiber, very, very, very healthy. So we have two kinds of squash in native cuisine. We have summer squash where you eat the outside. That would be a zucchini or a yellow squash or a Mexican squash. And then we have the hard shelled so butternut, acorn, pumpkin, those are all winter squashes. And that's because the ancestors ate one squash in the summer and one squash in the winter. So right now we're moving into all those winter squashes. So together, corn, beans, and squash are called the three sisters. They are interconnected. They provide almost every nutrient known to sustain human life. And it's not only the nutrients, but the way they grow. Corn needs nitrogen. Beans give nitrogen, beans need a pole, corn is the perfect pole. Squash has big leaves, shading the ground, keeping moisture in and weeds out. So these three are the foundation. Chilies, uh, very big here in the Southwest, pretty big on the East Coast, maybe not as big, but they do release endorphins in the body, lots of vitamin C. And here in the state of New Mexico, our state question is red or green. And what are they asking? Do you want red or green chili? So chilies add flavor, vitamins, and nutrients, and they're so beautiful. So you don't have to necessarily use a hot chili. You can use a hot or a mild chili, and uh, you'll still get those medicinal effects. So when the, the body, when you eat a chili, the body uh, recognizes you're eating something hot. It releases endorphins. These are the body's natural painkillers. So you're actually leave, left with a, a little bit of a high, only exercise in chocolate, do what chilies do. So there's a feel good response in all of this. Tomatoes also chock full of vitamins, probably the biggest antioxidant, uh, lycopene, and they have lots of other vitamins. Potatoes, very important. I know we see some diets out there saying no carbs, but uh, this plant, uh, going back seven to 10,000 years, very, very, very important. Uh, originating with the Inca, so Bolivia and Peru, and migrating uh, northward. Vanilla, originating in Mexico. I think the biggest thing for me is how did the ancestors know to harvest this? And how did they know that it would be highly valued for its flavor and combined with its sweet sister, cacao? Uh, vanilla and cacao almost always used together. Uh, cacao also releases endorphins. And again, how did the ancestors know that this pod would have beans that could be roasted and ground into now what we know as chocolate? So uh, cultivated foods, very important. Wild foods, also very important. We have the pecan here uh, in the South and the Southwest. We have the pine nut. Uh, half a cup of uh, pecans yield 671 calories. Pinyon nuts or pine nuts, 673 calories. So when there was no wild game, this particular, these two nuts provided sustenance, calories, good fats, and oils for native people. Choke cherries, I've actually planted what I call an edible landscape. These grow in the front of my house, and I harvested 33 pounds this year just from the bushes in my front yard. 
So again, very important, lots of wild uh, teas and plants that we also use. And then my favorite, this grows everywhere, all over the United States and other parts of the world. It's called purslene, uh, Bertilaga in Spanish, higher in omega-3s than a piece of salmon. So this weed, we want to stop uh, uh, spraying that weed killer and we want to say thank you, give thanks to this little weed plant and learn how to harvest it and use it in our food. So uh, first contact, what was uh, introduced to native people were all the domesticated animals. Um, I've listed some here. The horse was also introduced, uh, but we don't eat that. So I focused on just sheep, pork, beef, chicken, eggs, and very profoundly dairy. Uh, native people did not have any dairy, no dairy because you can't really milk a wild venison or a wild elk or a moose uh, or a bison. Um, and then all those stone fruits, watermelon, cabbage, some other root vegetables, wheat and wine uh, introduced. And so now we see some of these foods woven into uh, our native foods. I think a really good example would be sheep with the Navajo people. And these are just woven into the fabric, just like the tomato is Italian now, sheep are now Navajo. So these are woven in. So we can take a look at the East Coast and say that the first colony was uh, in uh, Jamestown, Virginia, 1607. Uh, and the pilgrims that actually left, and we have 1620, 2020. So Plymouth Rock is having its 400th year uh, uh, recognition of um, landing in Plymouth. Uh, and actually the pilgrims that left, they left Plymouth, Devon. Um, but we have to understand that they left uh, to practice their religion freely. Uh, they were a, the separatists, both the pilgrims and the Puritans were a uh, member of the sect of the separatists and they left England to start a settlement so that they could practice uh, religion. But I want you all to understand that history has differing perspectives. For the pilgrims and the Puritans leaving their homeland and coming to what is now the United States, this was a way for them to practice life without religious persecution. So good thing for them. However, for native people living in the regions where they colonized and settled, the same historic encounter probably felt much, much different, right? So history is always subjective. It's never objective. It's always about who's telling the story and from what perspective. I always use the bicycle wheel. So the historic event is in the center and there are many, many, many perspectives on that same historic event uh, uh, and differing perspectives of that. So the third period is the government issue period. Uh, the US government issued flour, lard, coffee, sugar, and the canned meat, which we now know as spam to native people when they were completely displaced. Remember, this was forced relocation. It wasn't a, a happy period in our history. Uh, the Indian taco or fry bread was made from those commodity foods. Uh, and um, the fascinating tidbit is uh, of the 574 federally recognized tribes, every single one knows how to make uh, fry bread and the iconic pan Indian or Indian taco that uh, is now on that fry bread. So this is an introduced food. Some people identify with this being as native because they see it at powwows and lots of fairs, but it is native from that uh, uh, period uh, of forced relocation. The new native foods that share components of all of these, food is our medicine again, we give thanks uh, these are fused together, and uh, here you can see some contemporary versions of some very old ancestral foods. Uh, and so what each Native community is doing is deciding and defining for the first time in history what goes on their table and why. This is a great example of bison with juniper berries, wild mushrooms, and some uh, pine, which is used uh, to marinate that bison with. Uh, here again, another example of a very old, old dish, uh, sunflower cakes, just sunflowers ground, blue corn and water, and then uh, pan fried or maybe made into dumplings and used in a super stew. So again, food is our medicine. It nurtures us, sustains us, and this is how we give thanks. 
this is our Thanksgiving. So I wanna just introduce a term called uh, Native American food sovereignty. This is food justice, food security, environmental justice, but all of this is dependent on something called TEK and TEK is how we pass on this information from one generation to the next. So people and land, the health of the land, the health of the people are inextricably linked. You can't have one without the other. And uh, when the bison were almost wiped out by Western European settlers, uh, native tribes have now started to reintroduce these and these foods are making a comeback. There's the intertribal bison uh, cooperative reintroducing uh, this native food and we're seeing it, it, the numbers come back up. So our ceremonies have always honored our foods. We give thanks and gratitude to everything we harvest. This is a form of food sovereignty. So this TEK is wisdom, it's science, it's how information is passed down. In native tradition, we pass things down orally. Winter is traditionally the time that we do that. We do it through songs, through stories, through beliefs, through recipes, uh, et cetera. And so the first Thanksgiving, when we come up to this holiday, uh, was not originally known as Thanksgiving. Uh, it was an, a, an autumn harvest feast. And the pilgrims that were harvesting were firing guns and cannons and the native uh, people. I'm gonna read you a little quote from uh, Ramona Peters, who is the historic preservation officer of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, uh, suggests that all the paintings that we're seeing uh, of people sitting down to a bountiful and harmonious meal with colonial families uh, is basically a lie. So uh, what happened was the native people came over because they heard the guns in the canyons and uh, wanted to know what was going on. But again, here just in this particular uh, rendition or drawing, you see uh, very few native people at the table with the pilgrims. I see one chief, uh, all the natives on a separate table. Uh, the pilgrims were giving thanks to God uh, for a successful harvest and the native people were giving thanks to the bounty of the harvest. So again, differing perspectives on the same historic event. We can think about what was on the table. Uh, the menu was definitely not what we're gonna see uh, next week, but we do know that corn, beans, squash, wild game, fruits, and probably some seafood. Uh, my hypothesis would be that mussels, lobster, eel, maybe clams or oysters also on that table. So we have a food movement where all of you, uh, I invite all of you to jump on and participate in this. We do need land, we need seeds, we need traditional farming and wild food gathering, we need cooking and nutrition classes. And when we have these things, we can revitalize the cultural, spiritual and physical connections. So here's Wilmer, he's tending to his plants, he sings to his plants, he gives thanks to his plants. This is one of my students from this year, May of 2020, Kelly Tongovia, and she's Hopi. And so one of her important ceremonies to give thanks is to learn about corn and corn grinding so that she can pass on how to make a very traditional blue cornbread. It's the oldest cornbread recipe that we know of on the planet, uh, Peaky. And this goes back, you can see she's cooking it on a hot stone. And then of course we can eat it uh, in a contemporary way uh, using these ancestral processes and carrying on these traditions. So I wanna encourage all of you to go online and look for uh, native foods sold by native people. There, you can buy blue corn, you can buy wild rice, you can buy indigenous beans, uh, you can buy culinary ash. All of these things perpetuate uh, the native traditions that are so important. And I wanna just stress that uh, it takes one generation, one, for information to be lost. So here you see a corn soup that we did. Uh, information starts at the beginning of time, spiraling outward. Four dots represent four generations, child, adolescent, middle-aged and elder. And if any of those generations, and this is true in all of our cultures because everyone's indigenous to somewhere, uh, if you don't know this, you cannot pass it on. So vitally important 
to teach about our ancestral foods, our traditions. We need the elders to pass these on to the younger generation. Here we see Governor Richard Mermejo and Tiffany Morgan. That information must be passed on uh, in order for this knowledge to perpetuate. So here's my contact information. Uh, I would encourage all of you to do a little screenshot of that. And um, we're gonna do some cooking tonight. So I'm gonna go into the other room. I'm gonna turn it back over to Mina. And um, I just wanna say that I hope you uh, learned something from this and uh, let's get cooking. So I'm gonna head over into the other area and I'll turn it over to you, Mina. That's it. Oh, Mina, you're still muted. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that wasn't helpful. Hi guys. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted so, for all that entire time. So we're gonna make two recipes tonight. Uh, we're gonna do a Boston baked beans. Uh, I have one in the oven, but I'm gonna show you how to make it so you can see it when it comes out of the oven. And we're gonna do a baked acorn squash with maple syrup and chopped pecans. So these would be perfect foods to serve uh, and honor native traditions uh, next week uh, on your table, whether uh, you're, most of us are gonna just be cooking for, I know, one or two. Walter's gonna be doing the camera. He's just gonna unplug and then he's gonna follow me around uh, so that we can see. But here we have some uh, corn. Uh, my dad's side of the family, uh, oh, he always teased my mom because he said, uh, Indian corn, he wanted to hang it on the front door like many East Coasters, but here we just grind this corn into a flour and we use it uh, in a lot of different ways. So uh, we're using uh, no great northern beans. Uh, Boston baked beans are, are made with either navy beans or uh, um, great northern beans, so you could use either of those. Uh, the one thing that you want to do in advance, and I, I love slow cooking, uh, is to uh, cook the beans in advance so that they're done uh, because uh, we're gonna start with beans that have already been cooked. But you can see the beans that we've used here. You can see our beautiful corn and our squash. So there again, those three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. Uh, and we're gonna be um, using, uh, focusing on bean and squash tonight, some maple syrup and, uh, these are going to be some of the things that we are, are going to be using uh, this evening. So the first thing that uh, we're going to do, and Walter is showing you those beautiful uh, ingredients, um, is uh, I'm going to take uh, some chopped onion, so you want to do a dice, and some chopped garlic. Uh, we're, we are going to be using, uh, so we're weaving together what was introduced uh, with what was there. So we have some maple syrup and we have a little bit of brown sugar. Uh, we are going to be using a little bit of molasses. We tested this recipe several different ways. Uh, we thought this came out the best. A little bit of mustard. I'm also going to be using the bean juice. So when you cook your beans, uh, notice that beautiful color. That's going to be our stock for those baked beans. Uh, we are gonna be using a little bit of ground cloves. And uh, I have uh, several different kinds of uh, maple syrup and all of you can um, use uh, whatever you want, but we do wanna do something. Uh, I like the grade A, but we have some maple syrup from Vermont. Uh, we have some Trader Joe's maple syrup. I have some maple syrup from uh, Minnesota. And then I also have some from Michigan. So we can get uh, maple syrup from a lot of different sources. Uh, again, I would encourage you if you can to buy uh, native sourced uh, because that helps those uh, Native American uh, enterprises. So uh, I've got my pan starting to heat. Uh, Walter's gonna follow me over and we're gonna start to saute. I'm using a little bit of sunflower oil and so I'm just gonna put oil in a cast iron pan 
and I'm using a cast iron pan because I'm going to put this right in the oven for my baked beans. And so uh, we're going to first saute those onions. And we want these to caramelize. I found that cast iron, and I know it's hard to find cast iron on the East Coast. Uh, Walter and I think that everybody put them on the wagons headed west and then stopped in some of those middle states. And you can see a lot more cast iron in Texas and Oklahoma uh, in some of the antique stores. So we love to go hunting uh, for antiques, but there's very few left uh, up and down uh, the Eastern seaboard. So we want to let these onions cook a little bit. Um, and we want to let them start to brown or caramelize. So I'm going to let those cook. And then I'm going to come over here and we're going to mix together the ingredients uh, to pour over the beans. So we're going to take some maple syrup and some brown sugar. Hey, Lois. Yeah. Um. Are there other syrups from different trees that are used in native cooking other than maple? Uh, well, I suppose you could use agave. Sure. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, but of course, uh, maple syrup being, um, you know, uh, the um, uh, indigenous to the East Coast. I'm going to add my cloves. So this is brown cloves. And I'm going to uh, take this bean juice uh, and I'll send the recipe to you, Mina, that you can share uh, that we developed for this uh, this evening. So I'm using two cups of that delicious bean. And then we are going to use uh, molasses. So we're going to get that into here. This was something definitely uh, from the research that I did that the, the colonists definitely were using. Uh, of course, sugar was not as abundant. Uh, it was probably much more revered uh, because there was less of it. So we're going to be adding that. And uh, we're going to add our Dijon mustard. And then what we want to do is just whisk this all uh, together. And that's going to be the base uh, for the beans. So I'm just stirring in. I want to get uh, all that uh, maple syrup. And you can see it's going to turn a beautiful uh, brown color. Um, and uh, that's going to be uh, what we're going to use uh, with the beans. So uh, Walter's going to follow me back over to the cast iron pan. And uh, we have our onions starting to turn brown, which is exactly what we want. You can see, uh, you can see them turning brown, which is uh, exactly, this is called caramelizing. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and add the garlic. And again, we're just giving that a stir. My heat is medium high to high, everybody. And you can see, you can actually hear, I love the smell of onions and garlic. And so here's a question for everyone. Were onions and garlic native or were they introduced by Europeans? So I'm gonna ask you to think about that. And actually the answer is not black and white. Native people did have wild onions and garlic, which we, uh, because we did not cultivate them, they were much smaller. So our wild onions are sort of like what you now see as a scallion and our wild garlic much smaller. Some of you may see uh, garlic like that in your farmer's market, but because Europeans cultivated and irrigated, the onions got much larger as did the garlic. And so uh, simultaneously, both in the old world and the new world, uh, both of these ingredients were used uh, in cooking. So pretty fascinating uh, information. And I cooked two cups of dried beans 
and that will yield six cups of cooked. So these beans, uh, the, the northern beans or the navy beans, they puff quite a bit. And so uh, you will yield six cups, which is about six people, right? I usually figure uh, people are going to want a whole uh, serving of this, but you could stretch it and, and serve uh, eight or ten uh, out of this dish as well. So look at that beautiful onion. See the brown there, everybody? This is exactly what we want. This is perfect. This is what we're looking for. This is called caramelizing. And so uh, chefs, remember cooking is all about the flavor. And so as chefs, we love uh, to do that. So I'm gonna add my beans to the pan. And give that a nice stir. We want those onions to get melded into uh, our beans because we cooked the beans without any seasoning uh, at all. And so these are just the cooked beans. Mm, the smell, you guys, it's so good. All right, and I am gonna use a little bit of salt. Uh, we like to use uh, kosher salt and sea salt or earth salt. Uh, salt, again, uh, Native people did use uh, if you lived by the ocean, you were drying that salt. Sea salt has lots of minerals in it, very important in the body. And uh, here in New Mexico, we have earth salts. Um, earth salts are very popular. Think pink Himalayan salt, uh, and they've got lots of minerals. Um, the way we used to get salt was from our natural spring water. Uh, many of our cities and our towns uh, take hard water, which is really mineral water, and they make it soft, so they filter out those minerals. And so we no longer get those earth minerals, those salts from the water. So it is important to incorporate some of that uh, back into your diet. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take this uh, marinade that we have and we're going to pour it into our pan. It's going to bubble up. You're going to see that beautiful dark color on the beans. And then I'm going to just turn this to low and we're going to let it simmer for about 10 minutes. Okay. So we're going to just turn that to low and let it simmer. And then after it simmers and all of those flavors, uh, sort of get melded into one another. Uh, I'm gonna put it in the oven to bake it. So the next thing that we're gonna do is we're going to get our squash ready and we're gonna be using acorn squash. You wanna cut your acorn squash in half. So you're just gonna take your knife and go all the way through. On the inside, you're going to have the seeds. So I'm just gonna take a spoon and take my spoon in there and get those seeds out. And uh, I am a big advocate of farm to table. Um, if you can get a local squash or an organic squash, I, I do advocate that you do so. Uh, a native way of being in the world or a native way of cooking is we don't throw anything away. We don't put it in the trash. So because this squash, this is part of giving thanks, because the squash is giving itself to us, we are going to honor the parts that we're not using and put that back to the earth. Uh, some of you may know this as uh, composting, uh, but we are going to uh, be thankful and give thanks to the squash uh, for doing that. So here I'm just taking a little spoon and scraping the seeds. And then it's got some fiber. So we want to get that fiber out of, uh, and then we're just going to put it down. So again, let's do that again. Just take your spoon, it should go right in and get those seeds out. Of course, uh, if you're using an organic squash or, or an heirloom squash, uh, you could um, dry those seeds and 
save them. And of course, uh, many people love uh, squash seeds or pumpkin seeds. So if I'll show you in a second, if I were gonna do that, what I would do is just take this cluster, get those seeds out. I could actually put them in a separate bowl and then these could get toasted in the oven uh, with um, some salt and you could have them as a snack. So squash seeds, pumpkin seeds, uh, completely uh, edible. So I could just take these organic seeds and make a snack for myself or for kids. This is a great snack. Uh, and then all we would do is put that on a little sheet pan with some salt and toast those. They would be delicious. So uh, different ways for using uh, some of uh, that ingredient. So again, let's get our squash cut. And notice I'm putting it on the tray uh, with the open side down because I am going to roast this in the oven. Here again, I'm using my spoon to just scrape the sort of fiber of the squash. And uh, whoever said chefs don't have muscles, right? We, we use this, there we go. You can see that fiber coming off, beautiful. We'll do one more. And then these are gonna go in the oven. So here again, using my spoon and uh, the recipe I have makes six of these. I'm just doing uh, two squash. So you'll be able to adjust uh, the recipe when you get it. So we're scraping that again, getting that fiber off the inside, uh, just using a teaspoon. You'll be able to see the difference that fiber comes right off. It's usually a darker color. And then I'm going to take one cup of water and we're going to use uh, warm water. Um, and Walter's going to show you here. Uh, so we're going to just take water and put that on the bottom. Want to just lift, making sure the water goes uh, underneath. And uh, we're going to take this and put this in the oven where it's going to bake for oh, close to an hour. And I'm gonna put that in the oven now. So Lois, you didn't spray the pan or put any butter or any anything on there? No, we're just using the water. That's a really good question. Okay. Yeah, and just in the water, okay. okay. In traditional cooking, would there be any use for the fiber of that squash? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, mostly we would use the seeds. Uh, these are the stringy uh, veins, um, but there are those great seeds which you could get out. Uh, you could use it in a sauce. Um, some of the, the fiber, we could cook it or saute it and then blend it. It would make a lovely sauce. So yeah. Thank you. And um, some of our elders here uh, actually take the seeds and dry them. And then uh, they make jewelry out of the squash and the melon seeds. I don't know how they do it because they have to stick a needle through each one and then string. But it's some of the most beautiful uh, seed art I've ever seen. So uh, some of the elders still doing this practice, uh, which we, um, it's almost a dying art because it's so labor intensive, but uh, it is beautiful. Um, and so we do uh, see that um, still in some uh, areas. So we have our, our squash. And then uh, the next thing um, that I'm going to do is show you how to toast the pecans. Uh, my pan over here will take a look of my uh, beans. They have a really nice color. They're reducing. 
and uh, that is about uh, four minutes away from going in the oven every and uh, let it reduce just a little more to finish out uh, the 10 minutes. And I'm gonna show you how to toast and chop the pecans because that's the other part that we're gonna be using uh, for this. So again, I'm using uh, a seasoned or dry cast iron pan. Pecans are going to come uh, in halves and we want our heat on high and we're just gonna put those dry nuts in there. And this is called dry toasting. Um, you can also do it in a toaster oven or an oven. Um, uh, I grew up with a mom, she had three kids and uh, she loved the toaster oven, but she was constantly forgetting uh, this, uh, a big oven or a toaster oven. And so uh, we always knew what kind of day it was gonna be because we would hear the scraping sound and the scraping sound was the toast for breakfast and she'd burned it, but we were gonna eat it anyway. So uh, I tend to like to do this on a stove top. And the reason I like to do it on the stove top is because it demands your attention. You must pay attention, right? You can't uh, talk to your kids or look at your email or do all these other things that distract us. So uh, I'm a big, big uh, advocate of doing this on the stove where it demands your attention, okay? Nina, have any other questions out there? Yeah, um, how hot is the oven cooking the squash? Is that 350? Yes, we are at 350 and uh, we are um, uh, going to cook the squash for about an hour. You'll see our beans still reducing over here, okay? And then this is gonna go in the oven, in the cast iron pan, uh, also for about an hour, okay? Okay. Um, I, wanted so, to follow, I wanted to follow up on the question about the maple syrup and the trees. Um, the uh, Deb who asked the question said she was thinking about like spruce trees, like French Canadians make spruce beer. Did um, natives use sap for other um, products? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the sap from the, the pine or the spruce, spruce is a pine, uh, absolutely used by native people. Um, and we still use it. We use it to marinate meat. We use it as scenting. Uh, we use it in our ceremonies. Uh, we use it in our dances. Uh, the sap is sometimes burned like incense. So here I'm gonna come over my nuts. You can actually see a little bit of uh, smoke coming off there. Look at that. So those nuts now are perfectly toasted and um, I can remove that pan. So yeah, spruce uh, definitely uh, used um, and still used. Uh, it's a great question by native people. So I have my nuts, I'm gonna chop those. And here I have some that are already chopped, but I also have, if you wanted to, this would be so good for this dish. Uh, we make a spiced chili pecan, uh, homemade, and these would also be delicious chopped up uh, on the squash. So uh, I put those out because Walter and I make those, but we're gonna go ahead and just chop our toasted uh, pecans for uh, the squash. So we want small pieces. I'm sorry, go ahead. Jane wants to know if you don't have a cast iron pan, what else can you put in the oven? Uh, well, I mean, you could use a casserole dish, but the whole point of using a cast iron, it might be something you want to invest in, uh, is you're going to need a casserole dish that you can cook on. Otherwise, you have to cook it in a pan, transfer it to a casserole dish, and then put it in the oven. And that's mm -hmm. going to increase your cooking time because that casserole dish is not going to be hot. Right. So I know for my brother's birthday this year, we said, what do you want? And he said, cast iron so everyone's cooking at home maybe now is the time uh to invest uh we bought this from loge uh which is i uh, has some great pans but you could saute it in a pan and then transfer it to um uh a uh 
casserole dish and then put the casserole dish with the beans in the oven. That is another option, okay? So that's Thank a you. great question too. Oh, Walter's whispering in my ear, antiques. Tell them to look at antique stores. Tell them to, to find some cast iron at antique stores. So that's another way uh, to do it. Right now with COVID, we probably have to wait on that. But uh, that is um, something to think about for the future. So here I'm chopping my nuts. You can smell, we toast because we want the toast to have a flavor. This is all about the flavor uh, and that flavor uh, coming from those toasted nuts. So uh, just making sure we have nice uh, pieces. So, Nicely chopped, but not really finely chopped. I like, both Walter and I like a little bit of texture uh, in our, uh, for the squash. So this is kind of a nice, and I'll just, all right. So for the rest of the squash dish, so there are our nuts, nice chopping. Okay, I'm going to put that in my bowl now. I have to ask Lois, would you ever consider sharing the recipe for the um, other pecans? The uh, I don't know. That's, that's one of our signature things. Uh, I'll have to think about that. Uh, oh, that. That one is a little more proprietary because uh, <laughs> we make those and we're only the ones that make it the way we do. But the other two recipes, the, the acorn, squash and uh, the beans, happy to share with you guys. We actually uh, worked on those specifically uh, for this class. But that's a good question, Nina. I have to think about that one. No, well, can, can we order them from you? Like, do you make them and sell, sell them online? Like, can we order them? Yeah, we could make an arrangement there. Yeah, we <laughs> could make an arrangement with you there. Okay, so uh, it's time to put my cast iron uh, in the oven. So I'm just gonna open uh, the oven and put my pan in the oven. And of course, cooking classes are magic, right? Because we have magically uh, one pan that's ready to come out. Uh, the first thing that I'm gonna show you how to do is the um, squash. So we have some squash that uh, is going to be right out of the oven. You'll see it starts to uh, wrinkle. And then we're just gonna turn that squash over. Look at that beautiful color. Okay, on the pan. I like to do this when it's still warm. And uh, for this dish, what's that? Nope, we're just, we're just, I think oh. I, my stomach grumbled. Uh, okay, <laughs> so what we're going to do now is we're going to pick uh, what maple syrup we want to pour on that. You can use uh, any uh, of the maple syrups that you have uh, access to. Um, I'm going to use some Vermont just so we keep it kind of East Coast. So this is Vermont maple syrup. And what we're going to do is uh, you'll measure it out. You're gonna pour that maple syrup onto the squash and let it go in. And then what we're going to do is, uh, so it's been baked. Once the squash comes out, it's completely hot. Uh, we're going to spoon on that maple syrup. It will start to go into the squash. Sometimes if you want, uh, you can do a little scoring. And if you score it, it goes into that squash a little bit more again, uh, up to you. Okay. And um, so we want to pour the squash on and then uh, we have our toasted nuts. Uh, the last thing that we're going to do, we're going to let this uh, penetrate into that. Uh, and then you have to think about a serving size. So uh, I usually like to cut the squash. So let me just move this over because we'll start to think about um, uh, how to plate this. So uh, Walter can easily eat a half squash. 
Uh, I like other flavors. Uh, and so what I would do is cut the squash in to a quarter. And then I would take a piece of that. So we're gonna think about, and this would be uh, actually, we're, we have no meat on the table today. We're just doing two plant-based recipes, but uh, this is perfect for your uh, vegan and vegetarians. Uh, I'm gonna take a tiny bit more of that maple syrup and drizzle it onto the plate. And then I'm going to take my toasted pecans and I'm going to sprinkle that onto the squash. My students love this. It was one of their favorite uh, dishes that we made um, in our cooking class. And uh, so uh, the next thing I'm gonna show you is we're gonna bring out our baked beans. And so this has been cooking uh, in the oven uh, for the full hour. And look at how beautiful that looks. So, you know, when we go back to that original question, do I have to use cast iron? This is so easy because you can just take it. Let me just get, there we go. Uh, see how beautiful that looks. Um, so again, it's going to be up to you, but they baked really nicely. I like to have a little bit of moisture uh, in the baked beans. Uh, but you can see, and you could bake this a little bit longer if you wanted. Uh, but what you see is things have started to caramelize. And then we can just take a spoonful of that. And we can put that uh, on the table if you're using cast iron, or we can actually spoon some of that. Here is, look at that beautiful color. The smell is amazing. So that could go on your plate and that would be uh, the baked beans. Um, I like to have a little bit of uh, liquid but again, totally up to you. We could cook that uh, a, a little bit more. And so uh, what we have is uh, some squash with the pecans. Um, and uh, I know uh, Walter's gonna be eating this uh, this evening. And uh, I also am gonna be uh, enjoying this uh, after our lecture, but we have some uh, pretty easy to make uh, baked beans and some uh, delicious squash. So I'm just gonna review with all of you uh, what we did so that everybody uh, can. Um, so for the acorn squash, you're gonna preheat your oven to 350, gonna cut your squash in half, gonna scoop out the seeds and the fibrous, uh, pulp from the squash. You could also use a uh, butternut squash. Um, you could you really use any kind of squash. Um, what will you get from that beautiful squash that's over there? So we have a, a local squash. Uh, some people call it Mexican squash. Or we call it Pueblo squash. You could also use this. So any kind of squash. Um, but we are definitely in the, uh, look at how beautiful this is, guys. So wow. I don't know if you have this uh, back east, but certainly acorn, butternut, uh, any of the squashes. So uh, then we're going to have, uh, so preheat the oven, take your squash, turn it upside down, add a cup of water and let it cook. And it will form a vacuum and it will start to steam that squash perfectly. It will get a little bit uh, brown on the pan. That's perfectly, uh, okay. So here you can see uh, the pan, see that good stuff. I can actually take uh, a spoon and this is all the delicious squash and keep putting that over 
my squash as it starts to cool down right before I serve it. Okay, yum. This one still has some uh, in it, it has a deeper hole of that squash. All right, and then that's how you would serve it. You can either serve uh, these pieces and then what we did was we used uh, maple syrup. Uh, for those of you uh, that don't want maple syrup, you could use agave or honey. So uh, agave and honey, um, again, uh, readily available. So either of these would work. Uh, this is an organic blue agave light, and this is a uh, multi-flower uh, mesquite honey um, from our uh, local. And so uh, the next thing you want to do is take your pecans and toast them. We toasted them in a dry pan. Um, there's a fine line between toasting and burning. So the easiest way to learn that fine line is to burn the nuts once. Once you burn them, you won't do it again because you will have learned. But uh, you want to take them out once it, they start to turn brown. Put them, take them off out of that pan uh, and put them on uh, a cutting board. You could also toast them in the oven, but again, you want to keep watch. And then we're just going to chop those pecans and those are going to get put uh, onto uh, the squash. And so that's it for that dish. Easy to do, using native foods, going back to the ancestral past, calling in the wisdom of the ancestors, and really being thankful. I think um, more and more people, as we cook more and more at home, are becoming uh, mindful of what we eat and what we put into our body, how we do that. And so all of this is about giving thanks. All of this is gratitude. Uh, scientists and doctors know that when you're in a state of appreciation or a state of gratitude, uh, your immune levels are up and you feel much better. So I wake up every morning and the first thing I do are my affirmations, which are basically giving thanks. What am I thankful for? My health, my life, my cats, my home, uh, where I live, my friends, my family, whatever it is in your life. And I just spend a couple of moments each morning giving thanks. I think that's what Thanksgiving is about, right? We have one day a year in the United States to give thanks, but every day, every day is Thanksgiving. Every day we need to be thankful for the people in our lives and, and what we have. And uh, when you look at something from a positive view, you feel better, when you feel better, your immune system's higher and then you can't get sick. So let's review the uh, uh, Lois's version of Boston baked beans. And we actually tried another recipe uh, that I found online um, where you put it all in a slow cooker and I thought oh this would be easy to show everyone it was awful uh, the beans never softened they were hard they tasted horrible we put them uh, out to the compost so the slow cooker version of this did not work uh, we tried two other versions this is our favorite so what you want to do is cook your beans and I am a big advocate of cooking my beans in a slow cooker so I just put dry beans, two cups of dry beans into a crock pot, slow cooker. Uh, I haven't jumped on yet. What is the machine that everyone's using? Um, oh, the Instant Pot. Instapot. I don't have <laughs> one yet, but for those of you that have an Instapot, you could use that. Uh, we wanna add more water than normal. So normal water would be two to one. We wanna add at least three to one. So two cups of uh, beans would be uh, three, three times three for each, that would be six cups because we want to have a little bit of that bean juice. This has nutrients, it has flavor, it has a little of the starch. So we actually use the bean juice uh, all the time. So this is a bean juice that I can continue to cook with from the beans that we cooked last night. Once your beans are cooked, and we usually let the slow cooker, so we turn it up to high, we bring it to a boil, we turn the slow cooker down to low, and then we let the beans slow cook, no salt, no seasoning, uh, overnight. Uh, so that's a full eight hours. 
And uh, the next day we strain it, we put the bean juice to the side and then the beans to the side. And uh, then we're ready to start getting ready uh, for the beans. So we're gonna use a tablespoon of uh, sunflower oil. You could use olive oil. I use sunflower oil, of course, because that's indigenous. Uh, we want one onion chopped, so about two cups. Uh, so that's medium to large, right? Uh, garlic, a teaspoon of finely chopped garlic. And then we use today a third of a cup of molasses, a third of a cup of brown sugar, three tablespoons of Dijon mustard, two tablespoons of maple syrup, Although Walter thought it was perfect there and I sneaked in one more tablespoon. So between two and three tablespoons of maple syrup. Uh, if you're not gonna use maple syrup, agave or honey, you might have to adjust because I didn't test this recipe that way. And then an eighth of a teaspoon of ground cloves. That's gonna get mixed into the bowl. Uh, that's gonna get whisked together. And then we sauteed the onion. That's gonna take about five to seven minutes till it turns brown in a saute or a cast iron pan. We added the garlic, another three minutes. Again, you're stirring to prevent burning, but we really wanna let those onions start to caramelize. Uh, caramelize just means turn brown, right? Think caramel. So we want those onions to turn brown. And then uh, we add our beans. We want to stir in those onions nice and evenly all the way around. And then that's when you add your seasoning. So the salt and the pepper gets added to the beans before you add the marinade. And then we added our marinade. And uh, I actually didn't even taste this since it came out of the oven. So uh, I've been smelling it. I wish you guys were here so that you could smell it as well, but I'm gonna go ahead and give it a taste. I know Walter's standing in the background going like this because he wants to be able to eat some as well. So just take a, a clean spoon and we'll give that a taste. Mm. It's so good, you guys. You're really gonna love this. It's easy. Um, you do want it in the oven. So after you've added your marinade, don't forget you're gonna simmer, bring it to a boil, let it simmer 10 minutes. That's part of the reducing and getting all the flavors. And then we put it in the oven and it bakes for one hour. And you'll get a nice uh, topping on that and you'll be able to serve it uh, and um, enjoy it with your family. So I'm gonna bring Chef Walter around and we're gonna open it up for some questions. So Chef Walter, come on around. Um, we really enjoyed this, you guys. And uh, it's been so much fun. Mina, I hope that you guys have learned something tonight that you did not know. Yep, actually I've been getting comments from people saying how much they've been enjoying it and um, how much they've learned. And we do have a few questions if you have a few minutes. Absolutely, we wanted to leave some time to interact with the audience and have a uh, question and answer time. So this is Chef Walter Whitewater. Do you Hi. wanna just do a little quick introduction, your clan? <laughs> well, um, uh, my name's Walter Whitewater. I'm today, I'm from Arizona, a place called Pinyon on Navajo Reservation. I'm from there, and, but I mostly work here, I'm here in Santa Fe. And the most I do, not the talking, no. I do all the cooking and testing the, the flavor and all that, and the hot shit milk and all that. So that's my area and I love what I do. And I hope you all enjoy it. And I keep saying to, to Lois whispering to her, the bacon. Oh, okay, <laughs> bacon, that's what he was saying. Yes, a lot of people would use uh, pork um, in this. He loves bacon, I don't eat pork, so. Uh, I made it without, uh, but he, he cooked some bacon and he'll sprinkle that on top. But a lot of the recipes did use yeah. pork. Uh, we chose to do it uh, this way. Uh, it's always easy to add meat. It's always harder to make it taste good without. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. we wanted to make something that tasted really good without, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I would like add smoked ham. 
that's mm. better than the baking, but to me. Salt so, pork, yeah, different. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so All right, so let's open it up to some questions, you guys. <laughs> sure. Um, what, uh, Carolyn asks, what corn dish would go with this? Ooh, homemade cornbread. And I was going to yeah. add one other dish. We actually got done a little earlier than I thought. Uh, cornbread, we would do a blue cornbread or a white cornbread or yellow cornbread, and that would be really, really good with um, these baked beans. Yeah. Um, Laura wants to know, it does sound really good. <laughs> does, uh, do you have a website recommendation where we can get beans and other foods that from native suppliers? Yeah, so um, we do sell some things on our website. Uh, that website is www.redmesacuisine.com. Uh, but native beans, there's a great company called Ramona Farms. Uh, they are Tohono O'odham and they sell lots of indigenous beans. Uh, and so you could go with them. Uh, Made in New Mexico has some beans uh, as well. And then a company out of Tucson called Native Seed Search sells beans, different kinds of beans. These beans are heirlooms. So not only can you cook and eat them, but you can also plant them. Remember, heirloom means that the seed is viable and that seed can be uh, propagated. The hybrid seeds, which were introduced in the 1900s, sort of brilliant on the seed people's part. Uh, and a bean, of course, is a seed as well. Um, they are sterile because they want you to go back to buy uh, those tomato seeds or uh, any of those uh, squash seeds. So any hybrid means that they took two heirlooms and made it into a hybrid. Uh, and so those seeds are not viable in terms of planting. So uh, those websites would uh, help you. Uh, on, uh, we sell Anasazi beans and tepary beans. Um, Ramona Farms sells mostly teparies. They have several different colors. Uh, Native Search will have more variety of beans. So you could look at all of those. Uh, and Native Seed Search, of course, will also have squash and chili seeds. And if you tell them where you're located, they have seeds specifically uh, perfectly suited to your environment that will grow well in your area. So oh, that's really helpful. Um, I have a question that kind of goes back to your presentation. Um, it sort of goes to the heart of the oppression of the First Nations people. Many people living on reservations land are not able to raise their own food or enough for their own of their own food and end up existing in food deserts where food is commodity food or from gas stations, dollar stores, things like that. In your opinion, how can we help promote an end to this oppressive systemic racism and what kind of food availability would make the biggest difference? Okay, so that's a sort of a, a very academic and loaded questions. Uh, Walter and I have dedicated our lives to working with tribal communities. Uh, we work with the Physicians Committee, which is in Washington, DC, and they sponsor us to go out onto uh, different communities. We did a presentation uh, earlier today with Microsoft globally on indigenous foods. We did a presentation last night with uh, uh, Native American Community Action. We teach recipes, we help uh, put gardens in. Uh, we work with the New Mexico Department of Health. Uh, they have funding. They are helping to put gardens into remote communities, whether they're raised beds or uh, actual farms and drip irrigation, some of the technology needed uh, so that communities can not only have food sovereignty, but self-sustainability. And that is a form of food justice, environmental justice and food sovereignty. So we're very active uh, in these areas and working on these issues. You're absolutely correct. There are remote areas that are food deserts. Native Seed Search gives free seeds to communities that wanna plant gardens. We encourage those communities to use that TEK, that indigenous knowledge, to dry farm or to use water if they have water to grow these crops so that they can be self-sufficient and in charge of the food that they eat uh, for their own health and wellness. So uh, there are issues being addressed. Uh, and you could also go online, there, there's room for all of you. As soon as you buy food from a native person that grew it, you help economically perpetuate that economic enterprise. 
So do this and look, Google, look for native organizations, native, uh, we buy locally from native farmers and then all we do is pass that on. And we do that because we did so many catering events and people couldn't get some of the food products that we were using. So we started to sell them. But uh, there are many other, there's little grandmas. We were talking about that today uh, earlier that have started to sell culinary ash. Go online, plug in culinary ash. It's on Etsy, buy the culinary ash, put it with the cornmeal, make cornbread or corn mush. And you're supporting these grandmas in a remote region of a reservation and giving them economic viability to do and process something that they know how to do that can help them remain on their land and uh, live uh, in accordance with, with uh, a good life, right? A, a fair wage. So great loaded question. You got me going, I could talk for hours, but I'll let <laughs> some other questions come in, Nina, sorry. No, no, that's good. That was a really important one and something that's been on my mind as well. Um, Hunter asks, says, my daughter read a children's book borrowed from the library called Fry Bread. Is fry bread easy to make? So uh, fry bread um, is easy to make. It's just flour, baking, powder, and water. Um, but we would encourage you to, eat, to make something called no fry fry bread. So frying in lard or frying in oil tastes good, but it's not that healthy. So we're trying to reclaim health and wellness. And so what we do is we make the dough and we actually, do we need dough still in the refrigerator? No. Okay, so uh, we make the dough, we roll it out and then we grill it. I'm gonna show you a little grill. Um, this little grill, uh, we just call the Santa Fe grill, put it over the open flame and we grill the bread. You could also grill it in a uh, cast iron pan. A lot of native people do that and then you're making the fry bread dough, you're just not frying it, so it's much healthier. It comes out sort of like a, a pita bread or a naan bread, um, and it doesn't have all of the lard or the oil. So these little grills uh, you can buy online at the Santa Fe School of Cooking, um, and this is where we got it. We teach native classes at Santa Fe School of Cooking, so uh, we use uh, that grill and that grill can be for roasting chilies or grilling pineapple or roasting tomatoes as well. So uh, that's what we do. But yes, uh, fried bread, uh, easy to make. Back to that original question. <laughs> um, so Emma wants to know what is dry farming? Okay, excellent question. Dry farming means that uh, native people have developed technology to be able to yield crops without irrigation. So dry farming means that the crops are not irrigated. This then brings in gratitude and thanks. Many of the ceremonial calendars, uh, Walter's people, the Hopi, some of the Pueblos that don't have access to water are able to plant. Some of the corn that's planted has actually acclimated to the desert environment. The roots are elongated and they can go down 18 to 24 inches to where there's water. And then when the monsoons come, the summer rains, which is why there's a ceremony, why there's a dance, why there's a prayer, why there's giving thanks, that water helps those crops to propagate and a crop is yielded without irrigation. And that technique is called dry farming. Okay, thank you. Um, we're just about out of time. So I just wanna ask one more question. That was mine actually. Um, because you and I had talked, Lois, for a while before we, you know, today happened. And one of the things you had told me that I thought was just fascinating was that there's not any documentation left from, for, from like your ancestral Native American, um, you know, peoples after, you know, the colonists came. Um, and, and I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about that. Like how, why, why would that be? Why would do you think, why would, there not be documentation anymore? So sort of two things happen. So both with the colonists and also with the Spanish. I mean, the Spanish destroyed almost all of the indigenous pictographs uh, from the native people to the South in, in, in Mexico, they're called mm -hmm. codices and they burned them or they changed them because they wanted to manipulate history so that when they told the story, that would be the truth, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a historical account that differs from your perspective, 
then someone can debate or question how you're telling the story. So rather than have multiple dialogues, which I think is where we are now in 2020, we want different opinions, we want multiple dialogues, we want different perspectives. Some of the, the colonizers did not. They mm. wanted to tell history from their perspective and their perspective alone. And the only way to do that is to destroy any other historical accounts, then they don't exist. So as native people, what do we do? Well, we have to reconnect, revitalize, reinvigorate some of these historical ways of doing something to be able to pass it on. And mm -hmm. just because that cord is broken doesn't mean we can't rebuild it, reconnect it, revitalize it. So that's a lot of what we do. And it isn't only here in Native America. This has happened all over the world, right? right. Colonizers went in and changed history to be from their perspective. Uh, and um, then how do you tell the story if you don't know what happened? You only tell it from how you know it. I mean, I grew up thinking Columbus discovered America. Well, we now know that Columbus using faulty maps, thinking the earth was flat, set sail for India and black pepper. And he found the Americas. He didn't know where he was. I'm sure he wasn't happy either. Uh, and then he turned around and he went back and he did bring foods that so the Colombian exchange is accurate. It's just saying that Columbus discovered America is inaccurate. And so really what we should say is Columbus accidentally stumbled upon right looking for something else. And so now Columbus Day is also Indigenous Peoples Day. So mm -hmm. we are rectifying history. We are retelling it. We are educating our youth. Libraries are really important. Nina, your job is crucial. Uh, we need historical societies. We need to look up records. We need to bring all the information that's still out there into one place so people can access it and draw the conclusions from, uh, from and for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. We, we want to be able to tell history uh, uh, as accurately as possible. And that's going to include multiple perspectives. Right, absolutely. I so impressed so interesting i i have to say that i i love the fact that you and walter use your voices to you know teach people these things without you know um i mean you just seem like you're you're so well um, oriented around all of these issues <laughs> and i love the fact that you use food as your vehicle to um teach people as well and to bring out some of the traditions and because it, it's it's a way that people feel very safe to talk about difficult topics. So um, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I feel like I've learned a tremendous amount. I know I've been getting comments through the, out, through the whole thing saying people are really appreciative. And um, we will, I will send out those recipes and I will send out some of the um, you know, informational things that we've just talked about. And I hope that people will do their own research and find out more as they, yeah. you know, and these two recipes are not in our cookbook, but we did do the cookbook that won uh, the James Beard Award. So if any of you uh, want that, we would be happy to uh, personally autograph one to you. This is the cookbook, lots of foods. It's gonna talk about uh, a lot of the history, uh, especially here uh, in the Southwest, but we are so honored that all of you tuned in and uh, we were able to reach out to you virtually. I wish you could all come on over and eat some of these yeah. baked beans. Now we have uh, we have two pans of baked beans, right? <laughs> and we tested it yesterday. So uh, Nina, thank you so much. And thank you to the Cary Library and the Lexington Historical Society. Uh, and thank you to all of you tuning in. Learn as much as you can. You know what I tell my students? Uh, knowledge is power. Well, why is knowledge power? Because once you know something, you have two choices. You can put blinders on and say, no, 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 no. I don't want to know that. I didn't want to know that. I don't want to, I don't want to think that. Or you can open yourself up and say, wow, that's something different than I thought. Uh, I never thought of it from that point of view or that perspective. So knowledge is power because we, we have the choice, the, uh, the power of one to be able to encompass uh, what has happened, what is, what will be, and, and move that forward and pass that on. Right, and for a librarian too, as, as a librarian, I think having the complete story is so much more interesting than just having one perspective. 
So uh, thank you for bringing that to the table. Get that? <laughs> so I know that was bad, sorry. <laughs> Have a wonderful night. Thank you everyone that's been here. And um, thank you. I, if I'm ever in Santa Fe, I will be looking up taking a class with you guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Any Please. of you that want to come, we would love to cook for you or see you or do a class. Yeah. Awesome. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.